So welcome everybody and thank you for being here. Who is in person and who is connected online. So thank you very much for this event where we will present a great new book, which is, well, a great new Italian book, which is the Italian translation of uh, uh, the book uh, Making Kim. And uh, my name is Roberta Rafaita. I'm Associate Professor of Cultural Anthropology here at Ca Foscari. And I'm Deputy Director of NISH, Center for Environmental Humanities, which is a center in partnership with the new Institute in Hamburg. Uh, today, we have uh, uh, very distinguished speakers with us. Uh, we have the authors of the, of the book that has been translated. And here we have the translators, I mean, not just translators, yeah, two out of three. We have Professor Federica Timeto, Associate Professor of Sociology of the Arts and Critical Animal Studies here at Ca Foscari. And we have Nina Ferrante, Senior Researchers at the University of Liège in Belgium. Uh, I bring you the greetings from Francesca Tarocco, who is director of NISH, and unfortunately she couldn't join us today. To, to start, I briefly read the, the biography the, of the two speakers of today, and briefly because <laughs> they have a huge, a huge biography. So Adil Clark is Professor Emerita of Sociology and History of Health Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research has centered on social, cultural, and historical studies of science, technology, and medicine with emphasis on biomedicalization and technologies for women. Her book, Disciplining Reproduction, Modernity, American Life Sciences, and the problem of sex, won the Basque Award, Society for Medical Anthropology, and the Fleck Award, Society for Social Studies of Science. Based in grounded theory, she also developed the method Situational Analysis. Her book, Situational Analysis, Grounded Theory After the Postmodern Turn, won the Cooley Distinguished Book Award, Society for the Study of Symbolic Interaction. With Rachel Washburn and Carrie Fries, she has published two readers in situational analysis and the second edition of the text. Clark received the 2013 Bernal Prize for Outstanding Contributions from the Society for Social Studies of Science and the 2015 Reader Award for Distinguished Contributions to Medical Sociology. Current projects focus on the politics of reproduction and qualitative research methods, including making kin, not population, reconceiving generations, which has been translated with the Italian title, title Making Kin, Fare parentele non popolazioni. Donna Haraway is distinguished professor emerita in the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She earned her PhD in biology at Yale in 1972 and writes and teaches in science and technology studies, feminist theory, and multi-species theory. She has served as thesis advisor for over 60 doctoral students in several disciplinary and inter interdisciplinary areas. At USSC, she is an active participant in the Science and Justice Research Center and Center for Cultural Studies. Attending to the intersection of biology with culture and politics, Haraway's work explores the string figures composed 
by science fact, science fiction, speculative feminism, speculative fabulation, science and technology studies, and multi-species wording. Her books include Staying with the Trouble, Manifestly Haraway, When Species Meet, The Companion Species Manifesto, The Haraway Reader, Modest Witness Second Millennium, Timian's Cyborgs and Women, Primate Visions, and Crystals, Fabrics and Fields. Fabric Fabrizio Terravova made a feature-length film titled Donna Haraway, Storytelling for Earthly Survival, 2016. And Diana Tosedo made Camille and Ulysse with Haraway and Vincent Despre, which was screened exactly here in this theater last spring. With Adil Clark, she uh, co-edited uh, uh, Making Him Not Population, which addresses questions of human numbers, feminist, anti-racist, reproductive, and environmental justice, and multi-species flourishing. So without further ado, I let the floor to my colleague and enjoy the evening. Thanks a lot, Roberta. Prima di iniziare, con questa preziosa conversazione, come studiose femministe e anche come curatrici e traduttrici, oltre a due c'è anche Angela Balzano, sentiamo l'urgenza di situarci rispetto a quello che sta accadendo in questi giorni in Italia e prendere posizione contro l'indirizzo chiaro del nuovo governo. Before starting this valuable conversation as scholars and feminists, we feel the urgency to situate ourselves with respect to what is happening in Italy these days and take a stand against the clear direction of the new government. Quando abbiamo letto Making Kin, abbiamo voluto tradurlo come gesto politico e condividere in uno spazio più largo e più vicino a, più vicino a noi parole e riflessioni per intrecciare e far moltiplicare le lotte sulla giustizia riproduttiva, ambientale e multispecie. When we read Making Kin, we wanted to translate it as a political gesture and share in a wider space and closer to us words and reflections to interweave and multiply the struggles on reproductive and environmental multispecies justice. Mentre pensavamo a questo incontro, la crisi ecologica e sociale, inasperita in modo esponenziale dalle guerre, ci mettevano davanti alla responsabilità di tenere viva una discussione per trovare modi per stare nel trouble. While planning this event, the ecological and social crisis exacerbated exponentially by wars put before us the responsibility to keep alive a discussion to find ways to stay with the trouble. In questi giorni il governo Meloni si insedia e rende chiaro sin dalla sua composizione che il fascismo non è solo una pagina della storia con cui non abbiamo fatto i conti, ma un problema attuale contro cui dobbiamo prendere posizione e un rischio concreto per il futuro contro cui siamo pronti a resistere. Now the Meloni government takes office and makes it clear from its composition that fascism is not just a page in history we have not come to terms with, but a current problem we must take a stand against and a real risk for the future we are ready to resist. Tra le cose che ci spingono oggi a prendere una posizione esplicita ci sono. Among the things that prompt us to take an explicit position today are. L'inaugurazione di un ministero della famiglia, della natalità e delle pari opportunità. The inauguration of a ministry of family, natality and equal opportunity. Ci aspettavamo da questa nuova composizione politica il trionfo dei movimenti che si autodefiniscono per la famiglia e pro-life. E sappiamo che questo significa contro le donne, le persone LGBTQ+, e l'autodeterminazione. Oggi risulta evidente che la guerra contro questi soggetti e i diritti conquistati con storie di lotte abbia preso una forma e, una, eh, abbia preso una forma e abbia un'autorità istituzionale, ma non solo. We expected from this new political composition the triumph of movements that call themselves pro-family and pro-life, and we know that this means against women, LGBTIQ plus people and self-determination. 
Today, it is clear that the war against these subjects and the rights won through histories of struggles taken a form and has authority which are institutional, not only that. C'è il nome stesso scelto per questo, per questo ministero che rende chiaro l'intreccio tra disciplina dei corpi e generi e il sogno razzista e specista di riproduzione della nazione in una cornice nostalgicamente fascista. There is the very name chosen, chosen for this ministry which makes clear the intertwining of the discipline of bodies and genders and the racist species dream of nation reproduction in a nostalgically facist framework. Making keen offre migliori strumenti per analizzare il rapporto che c'è tra i diritti riproduttivi e l'imperativo della riproduzione della popolazione umana e altra dall'umana come progetto coloniale e capitalista di sovranità nazionale e di supremazia bianca. Making Kin offers the best tools for analyzing the relationship between reproductive rights and the imperative of human and other than human population reproduction as a colonial and capitalist project of national sovereignty and white supremacy. Infine, l'idea che stiamo parlando perché ci meritiamo di parlare, visto che il nuovo Ministero dell'Istruzione è anche del merito e noi dovremmo esserci meritate um, questo spazio di parola. Finally, the idea that we are speaking because we deserve to speak, since the new Ministry of Education is also about merit and we should have deserved this speaking space. Ma noi prendiamo parola da femministe, non aspiriamo a sfondare da sole il tetto di cristallo, come ha dichiarato il primo presidente del Consiglio Donna, e non sentiamo di parlare perché ce lo siamo meritate. But we are taking the floor as feminists. We do not aspire to break through the glass ceiling on our own. And the first woman prime minister declared, and we do not feel we speak because we have earned it. La nostra voce è sostenuta da una comunità trasversale ed eterogenea, fatta di corpi che parlano diversi linguaggi e con cui diveniamo ogni giorno, anche convergendo nelle differenze, per produrre e far circolare saperi che sostengono il nostro organizzarci e assumerci la responsabilità di costruire e moltiplicare reti, relazioni e parentele trasversali, dentro e fuori dagli spazi istituzionali. Our voice is supported by a transversal and heterogeneous community made up of bodies that speak different languages and with whom we become every day, converging in our differences to produce and circulate knowledge that supports our organizing and take responsibility for building and multiplying transversal networks, relationships and kinship inside and outside institutional spaces. Make in fight fascism. Make in fight fascism. So, so we are very excited and honored and uh, extremely also anxious. <laughs> Uh, to be here in front of our uh, esteemed guests. And it is time now to leave the floor to Adele Clark for her first talk. Thank you very much for being here and for joining us in fight. Well, <clears throat> your statement is a very hard act to follow. Uh, and I only hope that the words that I offer are helpful in the project ahead of all of us. And we are delighted to be here and honored by your translation of our book. It's a huge amount of work and demonstrates an exceptional generosity of spirit. And we thank you for it. In considering my remarks tonight, I decided to be generous to those present who have not yet read our book and for those who have to underscore key transnational points. In 2000, first a little background. In 2013, Donna and I discovered that we shared a position on what became the key controversial issue engaged in making kin, not population. As feminists long vehemently opposed to all forms of population control, we both also worry that there are already too many people on this planet to be fed and nurtured 
given climate change and massive environmental degradation. And the situation is worsening. But when we publicly discussed this, even in fem feminist venues, each of us was met with what Donald later called a booming silence. Not a single word was said about our statements in this regard. Breaking that silence with each other, we decided to organize a panel session on these fraught issues at the 2015 meetings of the Society for Social Studies of Science. and invited wonderful colleagues to join us. Our session was standing room only with a couple of hundred folks generating incredible discussion of these and related issues. We therefore decided to turn our talks into a booklet that you have graciously translated to address this booming silence. David Hess has drawn our attention to undone science, research not pursued largely because it's unprofitable or too political or both. But there are also undone feminist politics and biopolitics, which have led us to ask, why hasn't the issue of too many people on the planet already become a major feminist concern inside and outside the academy, especially in relation to climate change and other environmental catastrophes from big agriculture to big pharma? Why haven't issues of racistly warped densities and distributions of human beings in conditions of structural injustice and forced displacement been systematically examined by more feminists as fundamental, including the thorny question of increasing numbers of people and limited resources? As feminists, we know we're not alone in raising these issues. However, such engagements remain thin on the ground compared to feminist pursuits of IVF, surrogacy, and related pronatalist uh, projects. Now I want to underscore what our book is not. First and foremost, it is not a manifesto. The contributors were not a collective, nor did we seek any form of collective voice in the making of the book. We did not necessarily agree on major or minor points or emphases. Some of our lack of accord is clear in the articles, notably differences between Donna and Michelle Murphy on the use of the word population, about which more later. But we are in profound accord that new forms of making kin are requisite. All the contributors emphasize and demonstrate a very rich range of ideas for making kin in new and or previously unseen, underemphasized or unrecognized ways. My own issue that I nag at is naming, uh, naming unnamed relations, tying knots in the ties that bind so that we can better recognize the new kin forms that we have been living and that, uh, need to be part of our discussions and need recognition. Next, I'm going to discuss my introduction to the volume ending with an overview of the contributions. Hopefully you will see what else is needed in this discourse and contribute it soon. We need to be much noisier and in many languages. Introducing Making Kin. I agonized more over this intro than I have done over anything else in decades. How on earth to claim it? I had to confront my own limitations as a white American progressive feminist scholar who has largely focused on what you heard earlier, um, especially reproductive rights now called uh, multi-species reproductive justice and the history and present forms of sterilization abuse, all mostly in the US. And I'm also a qualitative methodologist. And I didn't know you knew about the Italian um, book um, titled, pardon my Italian pronunciation, Dalla Grande Diriala Situational Analysis, Metodi Implicitamente Feministi, a cura di Giuseppina Sersosimo. 
from Kermany Publishers. And I deeply connect to all the ecological metaphors in the making kin discourse because ecological relationalities are at the core of the method that I developed. Anyway, together my areas of expertise led me to a double framing of the issues in making kin. What are the major social movements concerned with the key issues of making kin and what are the broader global backdrops against which those movements must be examined? Specifically, if we zoom in to more closely, look more closely at the domains, we find three core domains, reproduction, population, and the environment. Each manifests in strong, diverse, national, regional, and increasingly international, transnational social movements largely initiated during or prior to the early 20th century. First, the largely liberal to progressive feminist birth control, abortion, and related reproductive justice movements. Second, the largely conservative population demography and population control movements, plus at an odd angle, uh, anti-abortion movements. And third, a wide variety of more, less, and non-feminist conservation, environmental, and eco-justice movements. Their mutual influences, antipathies, overlaps, and alliances have become increasingly complex this century. And all such movements must primarily be understood at local and national levels where their practices can be analyzed uh, seriously. But if we zoom out, seeking the broader historical eco-political backdrops shaping these movements, we see overarching, several overarching interlocking motifs. All are lively today. First, the Anthropocene and Capitalocene world ecologies, historically undergirded by colonial annihilation of indigenous peoples and Haraway's plantation are seen pursued through the global slave trade in humans and other than human plants and animals. Second, post-World War II, we find what Murphy calls the economization of life, including the increasing specific monetization of humans and other, other than humans alike. And last, we have what Haraway calls the Thulucene as a possible current epoch and transspecies moral stance for making kin, supporting multi-species social justice and eco-justice and sustaining life itself. I focus here on these three overarching and interlocking motifs precisely because they are planet-wide. The Anthropocene is one name for the current geopolitical epoch uh, of our, on our planet, which in, <clears throat> during which human activity has become the dominant influence on climate, environment, geology, and ecosystems, human activity. However, Moore offered the more compelling alternative of the Capitalocene uh, as a name, since it was the rise of capital post-1450 that has most profoundly altered the relations of humans with the rest of nature since the rise of agriculture. For Moore, capitalism is not an economic system. It is not a social system. It is the exploitation of cheap nature. But today, the depletion and demise of cheap nature is demonstrated to us regularly by increasingly frequent weather and environmental catastrophes, climate change writ larger and larger, the breakdown of strategies that have sustained capital accumulation for over five centuries, meaning we are at a major turning point on the planet. Extending and specifying Moore's capitalocene and intervention, Haraway brings a more feminist perspective to capture a major shift. And by feminist, I mean progressive feminisms that are explicitly and profoundly anti-racist. Begun in colonial eras across the globe post-1492, 
plantations of many kinds, largely based on slave labor, were designed to create and sustain production of wealth related to extractable profits and relentless growth of capital. So the plantation are seen signals more clearly the earth changing patterns of forced life, forced death, and mass transportation of peoples, usually as slaves, plants, and animals, also often in slave-like conditions, inherently destructive of the simplifi uh, of the simplifications of formerly extant echo worlds. Moreover, Haraway notes that the plantation of scene is still with us in newer forms, in oil, palm, and coffee plantations, and monocropping more generally, all still dependent on quasi-slave relations. The plantation of scene epoch makes particular sense to us as feminists as be because it takes into account Winant's argument that race was invented along with the modern era. It was central to the liftoff of capitalism. Indigenous deaths in the Americas in the first century of European rule totaled 42 million, 80% of the total population, roughly. For the African continent, deaths directly attributable to the Atlantic slave trade included 8 to 10 million in Africa, 10 to 12 million in the Middle Passage, and 5 million in Jamaican seasoning camps alone. As Winant notes, slavery was among the first international businesses. The second global backdrop is uh, Michelle Murphy's framework of the economization of life. Here, a new imaginary of human population as a problematic emerged in the early 19th century and coalesced in mid 20th century national population control policies, typically conceptualized as development for new nation states supposedly emerging from their colonial pasts. Instead, they were, are recolonized as managed populations. The means of population control were themselves inscribed, especially on and into women's bodies, including coercively. He for Murphy at this scale of conceptualization, living human beings recede from view, rendering population itself as an experimental object, a lab rat, a guinea pig in need of governance. Murphy's economization of life theory again places reproduction at the heart of social, economic, and political theory. Capitalocene and plantationocene world ecologies and the economization of life speeded up post World War II, generating the Great Acceleration, the mass extinction of species, and increasing environmental degradation. Together, these set the scene for our present moment. What is to be done? Turning an important corner, not toward fantas fanta a fantasized Edenic future, but instead to attend to possibilities of alternative ways of living and being on this planet, including feminist ways, Donna Haraway offers what she calls the Thule scene as a possible current epoch. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. <laughs> we had pronunciation lessons on this word. <laughs> um, and the Thulu scene is a time place for learning to stay with the trouble of living and dying in responsibility on a damaged earth. Haraway pays careful attention to the enmeshed webs of multi-species living and being. It asks how the broadest kinds of accountabilities can be brought into play, especially through generating, maintaining, and valuing kinships and other mutualities that go far beyond the biogenetic. Instead of abandoning all hope 
with often masculinist driven claims that it is already too late for planet Earth. The Thule scene is about trying to take responsibility, trying to generate transspecies strategies for staying with the trouble we humans have already made. It is about joining in the ongoingness of life now with feminist modes of caring about and for a planet sorely in need of attention and discussed further in her talk tonight. Haraway's Thulucine is one response, one pathway among many emergent alternatives discussed in our booklet toward more ethical ways of refusing the premises of the capitalistine, the plantationistine, and the economization of life. Instead, the goal becomes taking more profound responsibility for environmental degradation and mass extinctions and struggling to make in value heterogeneous skin toward multi-species reproductive justice. In the book, I next discuss how diverse progressive, mostly US feminists have previously taken up these kinds of issues, but I'll not review that discussion here tonight. Instead, I wanna provide a brief synopsis of the other chapters um, with the exception of Donna's, who will discuss her own perspective shortly. Ruha Benjamin, a sociologist and professor of African-American studies at Princeton, focuses on the intersections of race, justice, and technology. In her chapter titled Black Afterlives Matter, she examines the relationship between race, reproduction, kinship, and Black feminist imaginaries. At a time when the everyday killing, an illegal killing of Black Americans is receiving global attention, the question remains, how do we make the matter of Black life central to ongoing feminist agendas? Subordination, subjugation, subaltern, which literally means under the earth, racialized populations are buried people. But as Ruha tells us, there is a lot happening underground. Not only coffins, but seeds, roots, Chrysomes and many other lines of flight into new worlds where alternative forms of kinship have room to grow and flourish. Nurturing Black afterlives is about enacting forms of kinship that both encompass and exceed biological relatedness, including, she notes, foster parenting and adoption. Black people also call upon their dead ancestors to solace and fortify, strengthen the living. The dead are sources of inspiration, giving the breath of life and the fortitude to go on living. Black people whose reproduction has been both a resource and a threat to the social order have long had to fashion elastic bonds of kinship to survive, sometimes called fictive kin. The insistence of Black afterlives mattering, then, as Ruha tells us, is a commitment to cultivating many kinds of kinfulness as part of the ongoing pursuit of reproductive echo justice. How am I on time? Sorry, no. I thought I thought that you were saying that you were uh, no. You are. You can talk. We don't. Okay. Talk. Good. All right. <laughs> I just my about tracker, time, my tracker uh, got lost. So I was distracted <laughs> a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Mich uh, so I, I've talked about Michelle Murphy's uh, work a, a bunch already. Oh, but she in her article offers the concept of alter life not afterlife, but alter life, as a way to name the politics of distributed reproduction and a project of non-innocently creating life differently together in conditions of ongoing mass and violence. Her specific focus is on creating alter life on the Great Lakes, drawing together indigenous land body resurgence 
the dismantling of settler colonial white supremacy, techno-scientific potentials, kinships, and the responsibilities in the ongoing aftermath of violence. She participates in a number of largely indigenous activist groups toward accomplishing specific aspects of alter life. Yuling Huang, a sociologist at National Ch Chung Kung University in Taiwan, has focused on population control in Cold War Asia and especially on rural IUD insertion projects, all coercive or mostly coercive. She was a student of Chao Ling Wu, a sociologist at National Taiwan University who has studied reproductive politics in Asia more generally. Together, they wrote a chapter on new feminist biopolitics in ultra low fertility East Asia. After decades of varied interventions to limit both populations in general and family size, many of them highly coercive, East Asia now has the lowest fertility rates in the world. Ironically, these national population control success stories have now <laughs> in the framings of some demographers are today promoting an array of pro-natalist policies to uh, correct. Uh, um, this is a key foundational fact of making kin. Once women have the option, and now it is usually optional, they commonly do not have many children. This makes coercive population control unnecessary. And East Asia offers the case studies for this. Wang and Wu's paper analyzed, analyzes three facets of feminist biopolitics. First, they argue that it's urgently necessary to reevaluate uh, drastic demographic changes by creating a new democracy with new pro woman conceptual tools. And this is probably needed worldwide. I'm just, I'm not. Uh, sophisticated enough demographically to, to follow through. But they they are argue for the inclusion of women workers and projections of future labor force, shockingly not currently done in East Asian nations. Women workers are omitted. Second, given threats to abortion rights and better understandings of the risks associated with assisted reproductive technologies, they argue that feminists need to seize the means of reproduction with challenging and multifaceted feminist agendas. Third, it's essential to reorganize social ties of commitment to create social lives beyond traditional family bonds. And they note that in Asia, traditional family bonds are disappearing rapidly. Uh, and this, they discuss a wide array array of co-housing alternatives being built and already being lived across Asia. Younger people are often not marrying, hence live alone or increasingly with housemates of varying ages, including elders. And uh, I heard from another colleague that several large apartment buildings, non-traditional apartment buildings, were have been constructed in Hamburg, Germany, specifically for co-housing and shared, shared child raising in a variety of constellations. So it's, it's, it's increasingly widespread and needs to be more so. Last, Huang and Wu seek to strengthen un understandings and ties across East Asia to engender, engender more deeply connected societies because within East Asia itself, Immigration restrictions and extreme residential segregation and stratification by nationality are not supportive of making non biogenic kin. Hence, they must be directly addressed. Last, Kim Talbert, professor of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, Canada, and a research chair, contributed a chapter titled Making Love and relations beyond settler sex and family. Here she interrogates settler sexualities and family constructs that have made both lands and humans, women, children, and lovers, for example, into property. 
Yet it is indigenous families that are often characterized as dysfunctional. Central to the colonial project, indigenous peoples have been disciplined by the US, Canada, and other nation states toward conforming to a monogamous heteronormative matter, marriage focused nuclear family ideal. In very sharp contrast, Talbert argues that settler sexualities and their unsustainable kin forms harm not only humans, but also the planet. She specifically considers how expansive and quite diverse indigenous patterns of kin relations, including with other than humans, can be more relationally just and such fairness needs to be legitimated as part of more capacious approaches to making kin. In conclusion, as progressive feminists at this historical moment, we find ourselves again confronted with concerns about losing what we already have achieved and fears of losing even more. We find ourselves in contradictory and at times even paralyzing positions regarding issues raised here. Profound concerns about the numbers of humans on the planet and their environmental consequences, the ongoingness of population control and the relentless demeaning of the reproduction of the poor, the continued lack of concern about contraceptive safety, especially long-acting reversible contraceptives, such as IUDs and injectables, which are most highly promoted among young women of color transnationally. And the decreasing accessibility, not only of, of abortion, but of reproductive health care and even contraception and on and on. Regardless, we must reconfigure progressive feminist positions on demography and reproduction to fully integrate urgent environmental conservation and other than human species concerns. We know too that even with our varied voices raised, all the key points have not been uh, made here. We sincerely hope that our work will provoke sorely needed fresh thinking, strong agendas and doable projects to facilitate making kin in new ways, despite such profound opposition that in the US our current situation is called the war on, against women. The challenges we face are transnational, but so too are feminisms, as this lovely translation of making can demonstrate so well. Thank you so much. Um. Sorry for before, but uh, we here from, from the state get a very uh, difficult sound, don't get very clear sound. And so we have difficulties in understanding some words and passages. Sorry for that. Maybe in uh, it's not for you know connecting online. This is a theater, but still, thank you again. I um, uh, hope that the audience could uh, get better than us here from the stage. Otherwise, please tell us and we'll try to fix something. Uh, so and so. Um, yeah, probably the, the earplugs or headphones or something could help. We cannot read the, the chat, sorry for that, but uh, if there are uh, complaints from home, please write it down and someone try to fix it. Uh, so it's, uh, thank you. Uh, it's now Donna's turn. Uh, thank you for everything. And um, we'll leave you the floor, the floor, the screen, but still. Your microphone is off. Of course, we tried a lot before this, but these things always happen. Uh, <laughs> try with uh, try without the 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 earplugs. Donna cannot unmute. Ah, okay. 
she saying that she uh, dice che non riesce a, a togliersi il muto perché lo deve fare qualcuno da lì. Okay, it it got fixed. The technician was not allowing me to Thanks. unmute myself. Uh, but it's fixed now. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um Adele, uh, first, thank you. Uh, collaborating with you has been a privilege of my life. Um, and it's been for many decades now for women and for the earth that deserves a future. Um, and I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm also speaking in solidarity with Italy, uh, with Hungary, with Brazil voting on Sunday, with the possibility that Bolsonaro will not leave power even if, he, uh, even if the vote for Lula is strong uh, for the United States with its um, growing fascist uh, and uh, anti-woman and racist um, just, um, apparatus. Speaking in solidarity today just feels urgent. And we speak, Adele and I, and all of us are speaking under the sign of making kin or reproductive justice is eco-justice or reproductive justice is multi-species justice and the other way around, multi-species justice is reproductive justice. And I think of Ruha Benjamin's statement in her amazing article in this book that uh, cultivating kinfulness is reproductive justice, that cultivating kinfulness, the apparatuses of capitalism, the apparatus of forced birth or forced contraception, the apparatus of force is kin breaking. Uh, the apparatus of the plantation was kin breaking. Uh, it destroyed communities. It destroyed the possibility of the continuity, continuity of generations, role of, of the people of the generations. It extracts the wealth of generations for a, a privileged few under the apparatuses of racial misogynist capitalism uh, in which the plantation of scene was one of the early inventions. I would like to st uh, stress from the beginning too that my own ability to write or think about the plantation of scene is deeply indebted uh, to writers like Sylvia Winter, like Catherine McKittrick, um, like uh, Sidney Mintz, like uh, Winnet, that uh, the, uh, the invention of a word is not the invention of an apparatus of analysis crucial to liberation struggles. And sometimes my uh, proliferation of words gets more importance than the apparatus that we're all addressing ourselves to. So I want to stress the degree to which my own work on the plantation of scene rests on the work of many others, particularly um, African and African-American scholars who have paid such um, uh, deep attention uh, to such suffering. Now, um, I'm thinking of the feminist call for the seizing of the means of reproduction uh, as one of our principal uh, cries. And the seizing of the means of reproduction is the seizing of the means of the continuity of generation, the seizing of the means of living and dying together uh, in flourishing. And living and dying together in flourishing with each other is also with the more than human, with the rocks and soils and waters and plants and animals and fungi uh, that make up the possibility of living in place that construct space and time so that the continuity of generations is situated. Um, and reproductive freedom and reproductive justice always have to be explicitly about this understanding of the more than human constitution of living, living and dying. Um, and I think that reproductive freedom, reproductive justice always must be understood uh, as multi-species justice, not in a way that separates nature and separates nature and culture, the world, the human from the rest of the world, but rather reproductive justice without human exceptionalism. That's not to say without human specificity, because the specificity of the particular kinds of capacities and lack of capacities of being human beings is very important. There is no kind of universal more than human or universal human. To, to think and live outside human exceptionalism is to take responsibility also for human specificities in connection with in, in that kind of webbing and string figural making with 
um, the more than human, as well as the extraordinary diversity of human beings, both in time and in place, both in history and in current uh, worldings. So um, I, like, I, I think it is also necessary in these times to think in terms, we can't not think in terms uh, without uh, cascading catastrophes. We, we live in times of cas catastrophes and we can use names like Maloney and Orban and Trump and Bolsonaro to figure the petrochemical war saturated catastrophes within which we are living, but they are deeper and older and harder than, uh, than those signifiers uh, let, us, uh, let us understand. Now, I'm trained as a biologist, and I, uh, I think as a biologist. Biology is not only my own fleshy, juicy body, uh, it's also a way, of, of, a way of relating to the world uh, ontologically, epistemologically, morally. And so I think in terms of ecological, evolutionary, developmental, historical biology or, or nature culture, biology society, that that implosion of nature culture. And I think in terms of co-making, co-sustaining, the always situated co-becoming and co-living and dying that we do with each other and reproductive justice and freedom are situated there. You will have noticed already that I can't say reproductive justice without also saying reproductive freedom because I'm not willing to lose the language of freedom. I'm not willing to lose the language of the uh, irreducible integrity and autonomy of, of, of beings for themselves as, as a way of being for each other, than being for each other as a way of producing liberty. And I think women's liberty can be subsumed, oddly, under calls for justice, even though I think justice includes uh, women's reproductive liberty in a radical sense. I, I'm intent on not losing the language of freedom I felt that way during the AIDS crisis too, that losing the language of sexual freedom uh, was, a, was a great loss in the way the pandemic of AIDS swept over um, and in many ways reproduced uh, in, in languages of care, often enough lost languages of liberty and sexual liberation and sexual freedom. And I want to claim all of it uh, and I'm, I, I'm a person who works by addition and not by subtraction. I learned that from Vincent Despray. When we enlarge our, our ways of thinking and speaking, we enlarge it and we don't erase uh, the other languages that are so necessary uh, to our understanding of making kin. And reproductive freedom uh, is part of that language. My doll back there, Aborto Libre from Chile, um, from the, uh, actually, no, from Morelia, from Mexico, this particular doll. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, fight for reproductive liberty in the form of the right to abortion that Latin Americans have made so much progress on uh, in recent years. And Northers and North Americans, Patatians, are losing ground as I speak. Uh, and that need for, uh, for, uh, for, for the integrity of the body. Um, that is so crucial to women and girls. I speak also in uh, acute consciousness because last week I gave a talk uh, in a rally against sexual violence. It was the 40th anniversary of the Santa Cruz Commission against sexual, uh, against sexual violence. And I gave a small talk in which I, I read or in a sense chanted that Chilean anthem, Tu es el violador. You are the violator. It was not what I wore. It's not where I was. It's not who I am. Um, it's the uh, address of violence against women's bodies in the form of femicide, the killing, the disappearing and killing of women of girls that is so terribly strong across the world, but especially in Latin America in America. And I think feminine eyes, including the struggle for abortion in Latin America right now is so strong in no small part because of the uh, experience of ongoing murder and disappearing of women and girls in large numbers. Uh, and the force of feminist anger and creativity coming out of Latin America right now is, is truly astonishing and requires our becoming cosmopolitan in that sense of allying our struggles, living in solidarity, kinfulness as a gathering operation, 
kinfulness, justice is a gathering operation. Kinfulness is gathering together. I'm not in biogenetic way, sure. I have nothing against, uh, well, I'll say more about this later. I think biofamilies are just fine. You know, it's addition. Uh, it's kinfulness as, as a, a kind of linking with and a foregrounding of the kind of kin making we need to be doing now, which is less biogenetic and less biogenetic and more with other human beings as well as with the more than human beings who make us all possible um, and who themselves, um, to use the language of rights, uh, have rights in their own, in their selves that are not about our ability to resource them for us. Living outside of human exceptionalism, among other things, means all the world is not resource for the making of humanity. And it's the fact, I think, that all the world cannot be resource for the making of humanity that makes people like Adele and me so feel so urgently about the supernumbering of the world with human beings, about the conversion of all of the world literally into food uh, for uh, one species uh, that lives off, that lives, lives in, Bruno, okay, Bruno Latour put it this way. There are two ways of thinking about living in the world, living, living and the world. There's living in the world and there's living off the world. There's living from the world. There's living through extraction from the world for the making of self. And if we are to be serious about being earthlings, we've got to stop living off the world and live in the world fully, which I think means among other things, paying attention to the burden of, of humanization of the position of the planet earth, as well as uh, beauty of so much of it. So I'm speaking in naturally threes. And the first little mini theme, it's really a maxi theme, I want to call attention to before my conclusion is to think about reproductive justice in the context of climate crisis, climate disaster, unequally lived. Climate disaster, climate crisis, unequally killing and making live and making die. And I, uh, three places came into my, my mind as I made notes for this uh, talk. I was thinking about flooding and desertification, the making of deserts and the making of floods uh, as, as emblematic of contemporary climate crisis and of the cracking and breaking of generations. And of course, I thought of the Sudan and perhaps of East Africa and the Horn of Africa more broadly. broadly. And Pakistan, perhaps the areas uh, of the world where the hurricanes and the flooding will be erasing food making land uh, for multi, multi millions. And of course, Puerto Rico, where the imposition of debt, disinvestment, extraction for decades has made of Puerto Rico uh, a, a disaster area that should be a land and could be a land of plenty and flourishing. Now, in each of these places, as you look at the pictures on television or elsewhere, you see the devastation of human beings and maybe especially the elderly and women and their children. Uh, the devastation of younger men is real too, but they have more options for survival uh, in general. Uh, and we see the absolute immiseration of the elderly and of women and their children. Um, uh, in, in all of these places, I can't even imagine what it would be like to try to make a baby live in a refugee camp in, uh, on the borders of the Sudan right now. I can't imagine what it would be like to get your children from Syria into the Netherlands across the uh, uh, numbers of barriers. I can't imagine what it would be like to get my children from Guatemala or El Salvador or Mexico or Haiti across the US southern border in the United States and anything with anything like the chance to flourish. So that the making kin and making generations and taking care of, uh, of each other and caring about the children is overwhelmingly caring about climate disaster unequally lived. Right now in the Sudan and elsewhere in East Africa, Peoples that have lived together with each other for a very long time with various levels of problem and occasional warfare and many other things are at each other's throats in quasi-genocidal ways over competition over water. 
because water is short in a multi uh, in a drought that is unprecedented in recent human history and will continue. The generation of war through drought, the generation of war through ongoing competition over energy, the, the war making apparatus of the earth destroying apparatus could not be more obvious. And the impact of that on uh, the making, uh, uh, the making of, of each other, including the making of babies. So I call our attention to flooding, desertification, and the climate disaster unequally lived. Then, as I've already begun to speak about immigration, I want to say a little bit more about that. I mentioned, uh, I began to speak about the southern border of the United States because, of course, that's acutely present in my own my own consciousness and my own life. I live in California. California is multiple conquest, terra, conquest territory. It was the indigenous peoples of California, initially by the Spanish conquest and the mission system. Uh, then again, by the Anglo system and the state making apparatus of the United States as California is made into a state. In each of these instances, borders are established that simply were not there before. And borders are always places of deciding who, li deciding who lives and dies, uh, who cannot. Borders are apparatuses of sorting who lives and dies and how. And the making of the border between California and Mexico as a kind of death trap is a state-making apparatus for the, for the United States. Uh, the making of borders are state-making apparatuses. Now, the making of borders in the United States right now also involve the, uh, involves the construction of, in a sense, sterile zones, sanitary zones, zones of utter, devasta of utter devastation, will create wide swaths of, of utter sterility, huge walls of interruption of corridors, the destruction of the National Butter a Butterfly Sanctuary land, the, uh, the breaking of the migration patterns of, patterns of insects, of, ja of, of jaguars, of the creatures of the night, of human beings and the other creatures of the night that are broken on the border that the border is an apparatus of the interruption of the continuity of generations, not just for human beings, but also for plants, animals, insects, uh, many others. And the creation of a kind of, uh, it's a, we see the, the stripping of children from families and the locking of them in cages or the busing them elsewhere out of sight, or perhaps no longer the actual stripping of families in quite the same way, but nonetheless, the breaking of the possibility of the flourishing of families. We see that. What we rarely understand is that is concomitant with, co-produced with the destruction of the more than human at the same time. Um, and that if we are to address uh, reproductive justice at the border, we must address it as an eco-justice, as a multi-species justice matter. Uh, that the caring for generations and the caring for each other has got to be framed in that way, uh, the broken connectivity. So I then come to what is perhaps the hardest part of my talk, which is thinking about the question of numbers. Uh, human uh, On November 15th, for what it's worth, uh, the official population of human beings on planet Earth will be 8 billion, okay? I think that's a really odd, these kinds of things, uh, I don't think you can necessarily see this very well. These kinds of charts, these kinds of numbers are very strange. They depend on data sets that are acquired in really strange ways, sometimes coercively. They are absolutely emblematic of what Michelle Murphy calls the economization of life, the turning of living and dying into the manipulations of models and data sets. I understand the violence of these abstractions. I think Michelle Murphy is right, is right. And obviously, I will use these apparatuses. I will use the generation of numbers of population. I will use the models, not innocently, not forgetting the history, frankly, not in disagreement with Michelle, agreement with Michelle Murphy's refusal, but I use them because I think they also say something important. Simultaneously with thinking on November 15th, we will be 8 billion, is knowing that today, as of, well, as of yesterday's or last week's report, uh, the decline in the uh, numbers 
of, of, of mammals on the earth is extreme. The decline in the numbers of insects, the decline in numbers of, uh, of um, uh, invertebrates in the seas, the devastation of the earth. The devastation of the earth is not done by those families with families with perhaps four or five children refugee camps in Sudan. Those people didn't do it. The people in Nepal who are flooded out didn't do it. Those people are victims of overreproduction. The overreproduction of the capitalist apparatus and its high consuming populations that demand ever more of the earth, even though my class on the earth is ever smaller demographically, it has ever greater impact in sucking the earth dry and then blaming the woman with five children in the refugee camp in Sudan as if she is having too many children, uh, as if she had any choice for one thing. Uh, but the, the overreproduction uh, of human beings on the earth is the overreproduction of the apparatus of extraction, including its people. Me, for example, the violator is me, not just you. Um, the apparatus of e the economization of life uh, is is. But I want also to call attention to a fact that I experience in my body. When I was born on this little chart, I was born in 1944. I'm born at the beginning of the great accelerations that produce what I call the, the explosion of the born ones and the explosion of the disappeared ones, okay? I'm born when the human population of the earth is about 2.4 billion human beings. And if I get my actuarial due and die when I'm 88, who knows, uh, the population of the earth will be about 8.5 billion. So from 2.5 to 8.5 billion human beings in the lifespan of one rich, white, overly privileged person is extraordinary. To think that doesn't matter leaves me uh, bewildered. The inability uh, to think with these numbers and simultaneously think against them, distribute them into their uh, situated worlds of justice and injustice, unequal living and dying, coercion and freedom, extraction and just being the victim of extraction. To think with and against these numbers seems to me essential feminist work. And I have been screamed at in, uh, in talks that I can't possibly be a feminist if I'm really talking about there being too many people on the earth. Nobody hears talking about the, uh, at that moment, people stop hearing the, uh, the non-negotiable opposition to coercive population control, the non-negotiable attention to the extractive apparatus of petrol capital and racial capitalism, the non-negotiable opposition to the world that, that plantations made, the worlds of slavery, breaking of kin, redistribution of crops, uh, destruction of croplands, um, the apparatus that lays the foundation for the extractive monocropping that is now global, um, the, the apparatus of the plantation of saying that remakes the world as, as a machine for the extraction of wealth for some for the benefit of others uh, in, uh, with apparatuses like slavery, genocide, and, um, and monocropping, a form of genocide. Um, so, at the, moment I, at the moment I start talking about the people and what it feels like in my own body to have gone, gone from about two and, a, two and four tenths to eight, eight and a half billion in my own overly privileged lifetime and that this matters, uh, even as I know how these numbers are generated and how imperfect they are and what a data set is. But I assure you that people who say we can't talk about these things as feminists at the same time are defending climate models that are based on large data sets that are also imperfect, that are, perfect, that are imperfectly sit in place, that work for greater resolution, but are fundamentally databases, the climate models. And to deny climate destruction um, uh, at that level is no longer acceptable within the progressive left. Okay. But it is acceptable to refuse to talk about the imperfect uh, apparatus, the imperfect, we have terribly imperfect means of talking about uh, the, the numbering of human beings on the earth. We have such imperfect means. And if we see an area of devastation 
from, look, from what looks like people making too large demands on an area and deforesting and, and bringing the soils to sterility and so on and so on, we always blame it on something else. Uh, we can't also talk about the question of numbers, distribution, timing, uh, and, and, and um, ways of living and dying with uh, a kind of, uh, of serious accounting for the people brought into this world and the absolute necessity for people brought into this world as new babies to have more than, surely more than one parent, but more than two parents. The kind of parenting that requires uh, many parents that are committed to that child for life the provision of siblings for kids who are perhaps the only bio baby of a mother or of a family, the need for siblings, the need for uh, uh, ways of collective living that make uh, caring and nurturing uh, kin an ordinary part of life. Uh, surely these are um, feminist projects and feminist urgencies. Uh, and so I think what I'm saying more than anything is the need to talk about the born ones, those of us who were propelled into existence by the post-World War II capitalist apparatus of neoliberalism and dislocated from land and moved into giant megacities all over the earth in conditions of immiseration, as well as it must be said, some really creative stuff and not just music, some ways of living, for example, in Lagos that are absolutely worth paying serious attention to. Anyhow, uh, the complexity of it all is also part of my theme, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we are part of the generations of the born ones. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the apparatus is extraordinary numbers. Uh, and simultaneously, an inflection point uh, of crisis. The earth can't sustain that for very long. A few decades was way too much, thank you. Uh, and the decline of the apparatus of the ability to sustain that kind of extraction, seen perhaps most evidently in climate disaster. But also look at this chart again, and I'm sorry I didn't make a slide so I could screen share. The green on my chart is people, okay? The growth of people. And the line is the growth rate. Okay, so the growth rate of the human population on the earth peaks around 1960 at about 2.1% taken as a global basis. And it's declining, 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 declining. So that in about 2100, there will probably be about 11 billion people on earth, assuming we don't all crash ourselves first. first. And the growth, the rate of increase will be zero. Okay, so we are living in this historically really interesting time, unique to evolutionary history on Earth of our species in our in our co-becoming with other species. Namely, the numbers of human beings will continue to increase significantly. Eight billion now, three billion by the end of the century, more if we're lucky. That is to say, if the reproductive rate continues to fall. But as there are more and more people and reproductive rates fall, Everywhere, everywhere women have a choice, everywhere, okay? We are also living in a world in which access to children is no longer to be taken for granted, okay? Uh, not just as labor, but as little joyful people, you know? So that the need to make families, uh, to, to have multiple parent <laughs> worlding, the, 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 I mean, think about what it means to have a zero growth rate and 11 billion human beings. Um, it is evolutionarily, ecologically, socially unheard of for our species to live in these uh, in relation to these kinds of curves, and it's happening really fast. And feminists are not talking about it. So I am there. Hi, thank you. It was amazing to hear both of you. It was super inspiring. I, I have to turn my back, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for, it's really strange for us because we have you um, behind, uh, you, behind us, uh, but- As yes. protective goddess <laughs> behind on our backs. Um, yeah, I have to pick up one of my two questions. Yeah, um, because we, we, we have 
many questions, but <laughs> because of the time, we think that we'll cut some um, stuff that we would like to say and um, we'll be a, very short. A nightmare <laughs> picking up one, but <laughs> I'm going to do it. Um, through the observation of ART, assisted reproductive technologies, we are allowed to see body parts moving through borders, not living being, nor people, nor animals, just body parts in global fertility chains. Following the new frontiers of capital accumulation through outsourced work of reproduction and new trajectories of colonial exploitation, it is possible to develop further critical perspective on reproductive potential. Looking at ART, it is more evident how the state and the market support each other while supporting a favored constituency, privileged mode of life, selected bodies. And I want to stress these selected bodies that are not subject to the right to choose, but objects of selection that defines which bodies deserve to reproduce, which ones serve global fertility chains, which ones are excluded, and finally, mere body parts might be the objects of selection. Talking about the king reproduction, the king reproduction, to deal with cross-border surrogacy, surrogacy as indentured life and afterlife of slavery. If we deploy the king reproduction in larger infrastructure of life and death, we might notice how the breeding and the conservation of animals is unquestioned and unbound of any, any ethical constraint. We see, for instance, how certain social value, beauty, productivity, biodiversity, are inscribed onto animal bodies through genomic infrastructure as extreme frontier for breeding. What I try to focus on as a scholar and activist is how to build multi-species reproductive justice platforms in which not only the agency of choosing is expressed, but also that of no longer being the object of selection. I would like to ask for your help to unpack what you meant with multi-species reproductive justice, how we make kin, meaning reproductive relationality beyond the human. Perhaps that's for both of us. Yeah. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I think pronatalist projects should be defunded. Uh, and I include um, a, a most uh, artificial reproductive technologies. I don't think there's anything wrong with them, frankly, in principle. Um, I also, um, uh, it, I have a similar position that I do in relation to sex work. I think sex work is honorable work. Uh, and I think reproductive surro surrogacy in the proper conditions with labor protections and other kinds of uh, matters could be, uh, uh, it could be fine. I'm not against it in principle. Um, for similar reasons to not, I'm not against sex work in principle. Uh, that said, my first research in relationship to artificial reproduction actually was in relation to the um, stud books in zoos and the forced reproductive apparatuses around um, uh, species that may not be around in another 10 or 20 years uh, anyway, but uh, the, the effort to, uh, de uh, to uh, slow extinction uh, for a range of charismatic macrofauna and other beings. And um, the, um, I understand the coercive apparatus addressed to other animals very well. Um, and I think that it is a, a coercive apparatus also addressed to people um, and uh, I have, speaking now for a minute, just around the question of the other animals, um, I have extremely and conflicted feelings around uh, projects undertaken uh, to slow extinction and perhaps open up the possibility of a future, open up a little space of time and place such that just maybe these populations of, of more than human beings will actually have a future. And I think the possibility of, it, of not intervening no longer exists. I think that human beings, if we're to cultivate our capacities for response, really must intervene because we're the ones who created those conditions. Uh, and we are the ones who must change those conditions. And perhaps as Thomas Van Dorn in his really 
searing, painful, riveting book talks about what it's like to live on the edge of extinction, uh, the suffering of the other animals who, who are subject uh, to these projects of slowing down their own extinction uh, is really extraordinary. Uh, and multi-species justice, I think, really requires paying attention to um, non-innocent practices of intervention, um, uh, both for people and other animals. And um, the fantasy of total liberty uh, is a death-dealing fantasy. I want to leap in here about what it means to nurture and what that has meant in terms of uh, experiments, in terms of cloning of endangered species, which Carrie Freese, my former student, studied and has a wonderful book about. There's a lot of interest in the cloning experiments. Then they discovered after the, the organisms were born, there were two, two problems. One was the debate about whether the animal counted as a member of the species, which is a scientific debate I'm not concerned about so much here. The other was that many of them died because of a lack of no basic knowledge of husbandry of those animals. They did not know what it meant to take care of a baby such and such and make sure it was nurtured and could live. So that the issues for multi-species survival is a it's similar issue for the nurturance and, and flourishing of our own human children. And the knowledge has to be a focus and we have to know what we're doing before we try and do it uh, in ways that uh, were not necessarily um, in place in early efforts. So. And also clearly habitat destruction is probably the principal cause that, of these uh, beings being threatened in the first place. Yes. Yeah, um, well, uh, we'll skip uh, through, through the end. We'll, uh, we want to conclude our conversation stressing the importance of work uh, in the book and for us as feminists and for our vision and imagination of the future. And uh, to take uh, uh, something that Donna very often repeats, which stories tell stories matter. And of course, matter is not a casual verb here because words do make differences. Um, making King gather some critiques of the disembodying and homogenizing aspects of the concept of population, of the universalizing aspects of the notion of Anthropocene and on, of the abstraction uh, more in general, showing how depriving matter of life also leads to colonialism and extractivism, usually abstract, abstract, abstracting is extracting as well. English language has the advantage of having the term matter, for which we have no corresponding term in Italian. Uh, we have contare, which however loses the materiality of matter and also poses another order of problems like who counts, who can count, who is only counted. Matter is mattering, a word is always wording. Uh, that is why we very much discussed about how to translate the term making in Italian. We eventually opted for fare to keep the material even crafty aspect of kin making, not the genealogical and bloody one. Now, my question is to conclude with, is there a way of keeping the creative force, even the generative power of this making in the maintenance uh, in the reproductive work, not productive in sense in the sense of productivist work of making kin. Adele, take that. Well, <laughs> uh, 
I think that's what I was trying to get at a few moments ago, not very coherently, but it's in the caring. It's in the caring. We, we you know, the, there's such a lovely, wonderful feminist literature on caring that we could we just read that and practice it. I think we'll be uh, uh, the tools have been given to us by our colleagues, by our sisters in the in this endeavor. Oh, and and that and and it, translating it across species is is a project that we all need to engage in. Shana? Yeah, and there, there's clearly a problem with the term making, uh, whether in English or Italian, in that it can uh, it, it seems to be uh, you know, something you do and make uh, and make happen and it devalues caring, which might be imagined as something somehow more passive. It's not, of course. Caring is extraordinarily active. And I think the mutter mater matter, the mothering, the, the rooting of matter and mothering uh, and, and the um, bringing into being and caring for uh, is are, are some of the tones that are really important to me. Uh, and I'm also intent on, on emphasizing that to make is not to make up, but it's to be in the mud with. Uh, it is to be in practices of caring, composition, decomposition, recomposition, to compose and be composed. Uh, so that I think of making in these, in these tones, which were taught to me by other feminists. Um, and so with Adele, uh, I feel that our genealogies that link us um, in the projects of somehow managing flourishing presence and futures with each other. Thank you, thank you very much. So I would, uh, apart from thanking you from the bottom of our earth uh, and uh, for, for what, what you wrote and for what you gathered in this book, as you, as you said before, gathering is also making kin and so thank you for the people who gathered here uh, today thank you for making kin through words and continents and nations and differences with us tonight and thank you for uh, gathering all these super interesting and uh, illuminating essays in the book and for yours as well and for editing this and creating whatever you do, because we really are fond of your thought and what you give us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot it, and for everything. A special joy. Yeah, and really, I love your cover too, by the way. I think that cover design is to die for. <laughs> <laughs>